In today's session of Gross Anatomy lecture, we are going to discuss about uh, the anatomy of the median nerve. And these are the objectives of today's lecture. Median nerve is formed by the union of lateral and medial cord of the brachial plexus. As you can see in this picture, this is the lateral cord of the brachial plexus and this one is the medial cord of the brachial plexus. So it is giving the branch from the lateral cord as well as from the medial cord to form the median nerve. So here the median nerve runs in the median plane of the forearm. That is the reason the name called as median nerve. And there is another name for the median nerve which is also called as laborer's nerve because it is responsible for the complex movements which means it gives innervation to the, all the muscles which are responsible for the complex movements of the forearm as well as the hand. And if you see the root value of the median nerve, it is C5 to T1 which means all the roots of the brachial plexus are involved in the formation of the median nerve. So if we see this picture, let us discuss about uh, the origin of the median nerve in detail. As I already mentioned you that the median nerve arises in the axilla mainly by two roots. So if you see in the brachial plexus picture, you can understand that it is formed by the lateral cord and the medial cord which gives off the lateral root and the medial root. For example, the lateral root of the median nerve arises from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus and the medial root of the median nerve arises from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. This is what is the origin of the median nerve in the axilla. Now let me explain about what is the course of the median nerve. For example, let me divide the arm totally into three compartments, right? So if you draw an imaginary line, this is the upper part of the arm above the line and uh, this is the middle part of the arm and this is the lower part of the arm. For example, if you see in the proximal arm, that is in the upper part of the arm, the median nerve lies lateral to the brachial artery, right? So this one is the brachial artery and in the upper part of the arm, the median nerve lies lateral to the brachial artery. But what happens is, by the time it reaches the middle of the arm, it crosses the brachial artery from lateral to the medial side in the mid arm. As you can see that the nerve is crossing the brachial artery from lateral to the medial side in the mid arm. And what happens is finally by the time it reaches the lower part of the arm, the nerve lies medial to the brachial artery, right? So here by the time it reaches the cubital fossa, as I already told you that in the lower part of the arm itself, the nerve is uh, medial to the brachial artery. So automatically you should think that it is also present medial to the brachial artery in the cubital fossa. Now it runs into the forearm and lies between the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus. As you can see this cut section of the muscle which is called as flexor digitorum superficialis muscle which is cut and you can clearly see that the nerve is passing between the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus. But while it is passing between these two muscles, the nerve is adherent to the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. Now, at the time it reaches the wrist, it is deep and lateral to the tendon of the palmaris longus. Here, you cannot see the tendon of the palmaris longus, but you can clearly see the nerve is passing deep to the flexor retinaculum. So here I will write, this is the flexor retinaculum. So what happens is it enters the palm by passing through the deeper aspect of the flexor retinaculum through the carpal bones, right? 
So this is what is the course of the median nerve. And next, let us discuss about uh, the relations in the arm. Okay. So as I already mentioned about the relations of the median nerve in the arm, in the proximal arm, the median nerve is related lateral to the brachial artery and in the mid of the arm, it crosses the brachial artery from lateral to the medial side. And if you see in the cubital fossa, the median nerve lies medial to the brachial artery that is posterior to the bicipital aponeurosis and in front of the brachialis muscle. So here what happens is, we know that the brachial artery by the time it reaches cubital fossa, it divides into radial and ulnar arteries. So as you can see that the median nerve is medial to the brachial artery, so automatically we can say that it is crossing the ulnar artery in the cubital fossa, right? So it is separated from the ulnar artery by the deep head of the pronator teres muscle, right? So now let us discuss about the relations in the forearm. As you can see from the arm, the nerve enters into the forearm by passing between the two heads of the pronator teres muscle. Remember that it reaches the forearm from the arm by passing between the two heads of the pronator teres muscle, right? If you see in the distal aspect of the forearm, that is at the distal region of the forearm, it passes beneath the fibrous arch of the flexor digitorum superficialis and lie on the surface of flexor digitorum profundus. For example, if you see the nerve like this, this is the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. It lies on the flexor digitorum profundus and superficially you have the flexor digitorum superficialis like this in the forearm it passes between the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus, right? So after that, let us discuss about the relations in the palm. As I already told you that the median nerve enters into the palm by passing deep to the flexor retinaculum through the tunnel, which is called as the carpal tunnel, right? Which is enclosed by the nine tendons. Now let us discuss about the branches of the median nerve. So what are the branches of the median nerve in the arm? So first let us divide the median nerve into arm, forearm and hand. Let us discuss one by one what are the branches in the arm, forearm as well as in the hand. First let me explain the branches in the arm. So just above the elbow means exactly by the time it is entering into the cubital fossa the median nerve gives off a branch to the pronator teres muscle itself and also it gives off a vascular branch to the brachial artery. So you should remember that just before entering the cubital fossa, which means at the distal aspect of the arm, the nerve is giving two branches. One is the muscular branch to the pronator teres muscle and the vascular branch to the brachial artery. Now, what are the branches of the median nerve in the cubital fossa? So one thing you should remember that in the cubital fossa, the median nerve gives off muscular branches, right? Where it supplies the muscles like flexor carpi radialis. So as you can see, this muscle is called as flexor carpi radialis and it supplies palmaris longus. So this is the cut section of the palmaris longus and also it supplies the flexor digitorum superficialis. So in the cubital fossa, it gives off totally three muscular branches. One is to the flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and next is flexor digitorum superficialis, right? So these are the branches in the cubital fossa. Next, what are the branches of the median nerve in the forearm? So the median nerve gives off one of its largest branch, which is called as the anterior interosseous nerve. So you cannot see the anterior interosseous nerve in this picture because it is uh, arising behind this flexor digitorum superficialis, but it gives off a largest branch, which is called as anterior interosseous nerve, which supplies this muscle 
which is called as flexor pollicis longus which is flexor pollicis longus right and also it supplies the lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus so as you can see in this picture that this is also a flexor digitorum profundus but this is the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus and this is the lateral half of the flexor digitorum profundus remember one important point that the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus is innervated by the ulnar nerve and the lateral half of the flexor digitorum profundus is innervated by the median nerve so in the forearm it is giving off a branch for flexor pollicis longus and lateral half of the flexor digitorum profundus and it also gives off a muscle which is present at the wrist band at the wrist which is called as pronator quadratus so there are three muscular branches in the forearm it also gives innervation to the pronator quadratus and also it supplies articular branches to the distal forearm and also to the wrist so here in the distal forearm the median nerve gives off a small palmar branch which supplies the skin over the base as well as the central palm so just before entering the carpal tunnel as you can say just before entering the carpal tunnel it gives off a branch which is called as palmar cutaneous nerve or we can say palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve mainly which supplies the skin over the base as well as the central aspect of the palm note one important point that the palmar branch passes superficial to the flexor retinaculum it does not pass deep to the flexor retinaculum that is the reason in carpal tunnel syndrome this palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve is not affected right now what are the other branches one is we have a communicating branch because communicating branch supplies ulnar nerve it has a vascular branch in the forearm the vascular branches in the forearm which gives innervation to the ulnar as well as radial arteries and also it has articular branches that articular branches supplies the elbow as well as the proximal radio ulnar joint right so this is what you need to know about the branches of the median nerve now what are the branches in the palm so in the palm the median nerve passes deep to the flexor retinaculum where it divides into medial as well as lateral divisions so first let me explain about the lateral division so here a lateral division as you can see this one is called as the the lateral division so which is a muscular branch which is also called as the recurrent branch which arises from the lateral division as you can see the recurrent branch this is a small branch which is arising from the lateral division to innervate mainly the thenar muscles right mainly to innervate the thenar muscles and the three digital nerves which supplies lateral one end of digits and thumb as you can see this is the lateral branch we supplies lateral one end of digits including thumb right so now next is the muscular branches curves around the distal margin of the flexor retinaculum and passes proximally over the flexor brevis then it passes between the flexor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis brevis where it supplies all the three important muscles at the thenar area that is abductor pollicis brevis opponens pollicis and flexor pollicis brevis so there are totally three digital branches which supply thumb and the lateral side of the index finger so this is what are the branches which is from the lateral division right and also a digital branch which supplies the index finger which also innervates the first lumbrical muscle and the next one is the medial division right so the medial division has two common digital branches where you can see very clearly in this picture so these two common digital branches supply second and third interdigital cleft middle as well as ring finger as you can see second and third interdigital cleft middle as well as uh, ring finger and also it supplies the second lumbrical and adjoining sides of the 
index finger. So these are the branches which are supplied by the medial division. Now, what is the clinical significance of the median nerve? In the clinical significance, the median nerve may get injured by the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. So exactly at the location above the condyles, there may be a chance of median nerve gets injured by the supracondylar fracture of the humerus as you can see in this x-ray picture. And also most commonly the median nerve gets injured by the carpal tunnel syndrome that is compression of the nerve when it is passing through the carpal tunnel and other causes for example if there is a colis fracture or any stab wound may also cause an injury to the median nerve. So we'll discuss about the deformity and the cause. For example, if the deformity, that is, if the forearm is in supine position in the supracondylar fracture of the humerus, it is mainly because the cause is due to paralysis of pronator, that is pronator teres and pronator quadratus. Because we know that the pronator teres and pronator quadratus are responsible for the pronation of the arm. Because of the paralysis of these two pronators, what happens is the pronation is lost and the forearm will be in the supine position. And the next deformity when the wrist is uh, adducted. When the wrist is adducted, it is mainly due to the cause that is paralysis of flexor carpi radialis muscle. And next, if the deformity where the wrist flexion is weak, it is mainly because of the paralysis of the long flexors of the forearm which is responsible for the weakness of the flexion of the wrist. Next one is pointing index finger. That is nothing but the flexion at the interphalangeal joints of the index and the middle finger is lost and they remain straight while making a fist as you can see in this picture which is mainly due to the paralysis of the long flexors of the digit and at last what is ape thumb deformity which is nothing but the flattening of the thenar muscles where the thumb is adducted and it is mainly due to the paralysis and the wasting of the muscles of the thenar eminence so this is what you need to know about the deformity and the causes now Whenever the median nerve gets injured in the supracondylar fracture, what are the vesomotor changes generally you will see? For example, the vesomotor changes are nothing but the skin of the three end of digits are warm, dry and scaly. It is mainly because of, because of the loss of sympathetic supply, those arterioles which are located at that anatomical area will be lost. So because of the loss of sympathetic innervation to the arterioles, what happens is there will be an arteriolar dilation which is responsible for the warm, dry and scaly skin. Now after supracondylar fracture of the humerus, next another very important clinical syndrome of the median nerve which is the carpal tunnel syndrome. It is the most common compressive neuropathy of the upper limb as it passes through the flexor retinaculum that is the carpal tunnel it may vulnerable to the injury. So here the carpal tunnel is tightly packed with the flexor tendons as you can see in this picture right very clearly. The carpal tunnel is tightly packed with the flexor tendon there are nine tendons which are surrounding this nerve and the synovial sheet. So there may be 0.1 to 10 percent of the population are uh, affecting from this carpal tunnel syndrome may be due to the compression neuropathy or maybe the synovium which is surrounding these tendon sheets may get inflammation. So clinically whatever may be the cause clinically if you see there will be a pain and tingling sensation over the sensory distribution of the median nerve except the skin of the thenar eminence because we know that the skin of the thenar eminence is supplied by the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve which I already told you that the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve passes above flexor retinaculum. So 
it will not get injured during carpal tunnel syndrome right now we know that what is the mechanism of the injury in the carpal tunnel syndrome that is one is due to compression neuropathy or maybe because of inflammation of the synovium which is covering these tendons right but remember one important point that the most common cause of the carpal tunnel syndrome is idiopathic and there are inflammatory causes example like rheumatoid arthritis and wrist osteoarthritis or maybe because of other causes like uh, post traumatic cases like bone thickening or there are some endocrine causes also which are responsible for the carpal tunnel syndrome the endocrine causes which are responsible for the thickening of the carpal bones in the conditions like acromegaly and also you will see in mixed edema there will be a development of carpal tunnel syndrome after knowing what are the causes of the carpal tunnel syndrome let us see what is the pathophysiology behind it as i already told you that there are nine tendons which are covering this nerve so these tendons of the hands are wrapped within a lining that produces a synovium fluid which lubricates all these tendons when active muscular contractions are taking place so whenever the repetitive movements of these tendons of the hand what happens is the lubrication system may malfunction so whenever the lubrication system malfunction happens there will be an increase in the friction so whenever there will be an increase in the friction then there might be a development of inflammation of that synovial sheet responsible for the development of carpal tunnel syndrome which creates a pressure within the canal this pressure compresses the nerve inside the carpal tunnel right so this pressure causes obstruction to the venous outflow and uh, there will be a back pressure that is responsible for the development of edema and ultimately ischemia of the nerve is the final complication but ischemia of the nerve is a rare complication of the carpal tunnel syndrome so this is what is the pathophysiology behind the carpal tunnel syndrome so we came to know what is the pathophysiology that is the mechanism behind uh, the development of carpal tunnel syndrome so now what are the important signs and symptoms of the syndrome so main importantly in any of the examinations they will give you there will be a nocturnal numbness and paresthesia of the median nerve distribution or pathognomic in this case so the tingling sensation or pain or paresthesia is more severe during night when compared to that of morning or in the daytime and not only that there will be a sensory loss that is sensory loss mainly seen in the three and off digits right this is one two three and off right so because the median nerve is distributing the three and off digits you will see the sensory loss in lateral three and off digits including the nail bits and distal phalanges of the dorsum of the hand so along with the sensory loss because it is also supplying the muscles of the hand there will be a motor loss too so there will be a weakness and wasting of uh, the muscles which are innervated by the median nerve in the hand so you can remember a mnemonic uh, with this law of muscles that is l o a f l stands for first and uh, second lumbricals l stands for lumbricals and o stands for opponent's pollicis and a stands for adductor pollicis brevis and f stands for flexor pollicis brevis so all these four muscles may have the motor deformity that is paralysis of all these four muscles which are mainly seen in the carpal tunnel syndrome because innervated by the median nerve in the hand so because of this what happens there will be a ape thumb deformity so i already told you what do you mean by the ape thumb deformity because of the loss of motor innervation to the thenar muscles there will be a flattening of the thenar muscles and the thumb is adducted what you can see in this picture this is called as ape thumb deformity so and what is the pointing index finger here so you can see this picture very clearly 
that there will be a flexion at the interphalangeal joints of the index and middle finger is lost and they remain straight while making a first right and next what are the vasomotor and tropic changes which are seen in the carpal tunnel syndrome the skin of uh, the three end of digits are warm dry scaly and the nails remains brittle mainly because of i already told you the pathophysiological mechanism that is due to arteriolar dilation and edema formation at that area now what is the froment's sign so remember the froment sign is positive mainly in the carpal tunnel syndrome patients what is this sign about the patient is unable to hold a book between the thumb and other fingers due to the paralysis of the inner muscles right so this is called as the fromets sign and there is also another test to assess the function of the median nerve that is called as the paper holding test so what is the paper holding test as you can see in this picture that the patient is unable to hold a paper between thumb and other fingers mainly due to the paralysis of the thinar muscles and the next one is the tineal sign this is one of the very important sign generally they will ask you in all the examinations for the median nerve so tineal sign positive means it is nothing but this uh, it is mainly performed by slightly percussing over the nerve to elicit sensation of uh, tingling or pins and needles over the distribution of the nerve is called as the tineal sign and another test which is present which is called as the phalanx test so what is the phalanx test full flexion of the wrist for 60 seconds induces a tingling sensation over the median nerve distribution so the full extension for reverse phalanx test and another test is called as carpal compression test so if you apply pressure on the carpal tunnel with the thumb which produces the same symptoms which is called as carpal compression test right now what are the investigations which are available for the carpal tunnel syndrome so mainly you need to know what is the conduction velocity of this nerve because mainly during compression of mononeuropathies you will conduct nerve conduction studies to assess the function of this nerve right so investigations are nerve conduction studies to assess the median nerve function now let us talk about what are the treatment options which are available in the carpal tunnel syndrome in milder cases there will be a non operative procedure or non operative treatment but in severe cases operation or surgery is indicated so what are the non operative procedures or the treatment options which are available for the carpal tunnel syndrome one is the steroid injections to reduce the pain we will also give non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs stretching exercises and wrist splinting is important in neutral position especially at the night because the symptoms are worst at night so these are the non operative treatment procedures which are available and in severe cases the operative treatment includes an endoscopic release of the carpal tunnel or there will be an open carpal tunnel release these are the two operative procedures which are available for the carpal tunnel syndrome so by this we completed our lecture with the clinical anatomy of the median nerve